Walter. And welcome to another reading from Tales of Old Ireland Retold by myself, Laura O'Brien. And today we're actually reading one of my favourites. So I don't know when this will reach you if you're out on in the YouTube lands, but um, this one is being recorded for my Patreon as usual um, because my three dollar and up patrons get an audio story every single month um, before anybody else so i'm not releasing all of them but some of them might make it out to youtube at some point but this is a favorite and i haven't quite decided if i want to go public with this one um i think this might be my favorite story that i've ever written maybe uh, it's called the brush and comb and of course it's a morrigan and dagda story she had left it too long again, out in the war, doing the work in this world, carrying the weight of it. Too long here and too far from home now, not enough left to get her back to her world. Damn it, she would have to go to him. She began to walk there. Oh, she knew the ways well enough and had been there enough times by choice, by design by right. In different circumstances, with a different outlook, a different intent, a visit there was almost welcome. A bright interlude, if brief, that would entertain and often even refresh her for the work out there. He knew well how to host, after all. And the food was always good. It wasn't too far from to there from here by the ways of this world as the crow flies one might say but the weight of it all had made her so heavy with doing her work she took it all on took it all inside herself to shape and twist and mold and bend and form again into what should be but sometimes at these times she took too much and with all she already did, there wasn't enough inside in herself to change it and make it right the way it could be. And she became so heavy with it all. It stuck her here in this world that wasn't hers. Her feet fell flat on the earth with each step. There was nothing left to lift her, to let her dance and turn. Her arms hung at her sides, her head drooped down, her shoulders fell forward as she walked. It wasn't too far now. She could make it that far at least, even if no further, and then he would be there, and this would be better. He had made it better before, the once or twice she had left it too long and not been close enough to get home. He was good that way. So she was never sure what he'd done exactly. His ways were yet a mystery to her, although she saw so much in every other direction. It was much about him she did not see and could not read if she did. It vexed her. Thoughts on her destination only now, on having enough, just enough to get her there. One step, one step, one step. Not seeing further than the next step. Perhaps the clearest indication of all just how close she had come to the end of herself. When the rain began, it covered her quickly and soaked her through, adding directly to the weight of all she carried, of all she had become. The wool of her cloak did not keep it from her flesh becoming sodden and adding so much burden to her shoulders that she released the pins and dropped it behind her, allowing the ice of the downpour to seep through her skin and down to the bones of her, draining her even more. The brew was in sight when her strength finally ran out. In truth, it had run, run out long before that and only her will had driven her on. But it was with the light 
and the hearth smoke and the noise of his place in view on the horizon that her feet stopped stepping and the weight she carried deep in the core of her finally felled her to the earth of this world. She woke to darkness. The round walls of a chamber surrounded her, interlocking stone and the fresh dug scent of cool earth. A new build, and she knew his handiwork well enough by now. So he had found her when she fell. He had laid her on a pallet of woven ivy, a favorite of hers in this world, and he'd remembered well. There was a passage beyond, leading from the chamber, with light enough coming through to make out a three-legged stool by the side of her bed. And around it on the ground were wood shavings. Her mind filled in the blanks, and she could see where he'd sat by her side and carved as he waited, an old habit of his in troubled times, to find the heart of the wood and release its true form and on the stool the shape of a thing. She reached out her hand and picked it up, feeling with her thumb the smooth, round edge on one side and the fine, wide teeth on the other. Touching her hair, she felt how it had been released from its braids and combed out smooth. Well, time enough to retie those responsibilities when she went back out into the worlds rising and naked enough to raise her own eyebrow, she stepped towards the passage, moving silently on the balls of her feet. There was a short connecting path to another chamber, the same size as the first, but seeming so much smaller for being filled with his large frame and a crackling fire besides. She stayed in the shadows, completely quiet and well hidden and watched his form, the movement of his hands. As he turned carefully in the small space, feeding the fire from a stock of wood by the wall behind him and settled back again to more carving. His knife blade glinted liquid fire back to her and bounced it off the chamber roof where a small opening released the smoke to the sky. So you're awake, lass. I wasn't sure you'd make it back from that one. You've been gone a while. She never could hide from him. Not completely. What's that you carve? She didn't want to discuss what had brought her here, nor how close she had come again this time. He knew it, and she knew it. And they both knew she'd do it again if she had to. It was just the way of things and the work that had to be done. His frown lifted a little, and though there was no softness or smile to his voice, he never did move from concern to contentment quickly at all, for he felt it too deeply. She heard the care for her there, as he said, it's the back of a brush to match your comb. Your hair was in an awful mess and I thought deep brown eyes sought hers and she was sorry for the fear she saw they held and the pain. They both knew there was nothing they could do for it. She had her work and he had his, but she didn't like to see it nonetheless. Circling round the fire, she stood behind him, causing a hiss and indrawn breath as her cold hand found his broad shoulder. But the usual warmth of his flesh soon balanced him out. He relaxed back to lean against her, heaving a sigh as his head leaned to her thigh 
and the fingers of her other hand played idly with his curls while she delayed the inevitable for just a few moments longer. I'll walk you out, lass. I know you've to be on your way. I'm... I'm glad you came. A little way beyond the brew, where they'd walk together in the silence of those who can't speak as they'd like, she stopped. She could feel the world's calling again, the endless ebb and flow, the push and pull, the patterns forming and unforming. There was past time to take back up with her work. Turning to tell him goodbye for now, she caught sight of the two chambers he had built for her rest above on the brow of the hill by the brew. And now it was her turn to frown. Can you tell me, good husband, why exactly yon mounds are shaped so perfectly like the breasts I sometimes wear upon my very chest? He had the grace to blush just a little at that and told her the story of how he had found her in the pouring rain and soaked through without a cloak on that very spot. And hadn't her lovely form been outlined against the sky so perfectly that, well, he couldn't help but notice the shape she wore. It wasn't a decision he'd made at the time, though he did observe it himself afterwards indeed. But maybe he had been influenced by her particular shape at that time, and sure, was that a bad thing at all now, really, in the grand scheme of things? The glint in his eye as he looked at her, a little shamefaced, caused a laugh <laughs> despite herself, and she felt it lift her to let her dance and turn. It was a very different form that looked down at him then from the branches of a tree. He wasn't sure a crow should have eyebrows or how he felt about having one of them raised at him, but he was glad to see her form again into what should be and glad to hear her cry on the wind in the open sky as she went back out to her work. Turning to the brew, he went back to his, leaving the brush and comb where they were in the chambers for the next time she needed to come to him. For that was her place now. Now, that's not the first time the Dagda and the Morrigan came together to set things right. But sure, they're all stories for another day. Now, I wasn't joking when I said that that story was my favourite and really got me. And it was inspired by them, by my perception of a possible relationship between them and how their dynamic works, um, by my relationship with her, by my understanding of how heavy the work that she does, past, present and future, can be and all that she carries, and how it might affect her, even as a deity. And there's not, to be perfectly honest, there's just a tiny bit of protection, no, not protection, maybe, projection in there, in case that wasn't obvious. So, oh, and the main thing that it was inspired by is actually the, um, the, um, the basically the two breasts of the Morrigan, which are two mounds which lie directly beside Brunaboinia, which is uh, Newgrange, known as Newgrange now, um, which was originally the Dagda's, way, way back was the Dagda's home, his mound, his place, and uh, was uh, superseded then to his son, Angus MacOg. So, Definitely a, a, a creative work and take it as you will, take it with a pinch of salt. Um, the Brush and the Comb is one of the names that's recorded in relation to that site. So it was a, a curious mix of inspiration and creativity that uh, formed that story. So I hope you enjoyed it. I'm sorry for the well of emotion. And also um, I'm in my comfy robe today, so I'm, you know, having a day. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed it and I 
really would like to share the rest of these stories with you. So if you're on Patreon, thank you for your support. It is very, very much appreciated. And if you're not on Patreon, if you're catching this on YouTube at some point or somewhere else along the way, then uh, please do consider joining up on Patreon where there are many stories such as this and uh, a new one every month that I'm recording. Okay, so it's longer full and I will see you in the next video. It's patreon.com forward slash Laura O'Brien. All the links are below.